Okay, welcome everyone. This is the penultimate um, talk before Christmas, and we're fortunate this week to have Nadia Drenska. So Nadia did her PhD at the Grant Institute and is currently a postdoc in Minnesota, and she's going to talk to us today about a PD interpretation or prediction with expert advice. Thank you, Nadia. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Matt, and uh, thank you for organizing to all the organizers. Um, I'm Nadia Drenska, and I'll present today on uh, PD interpretation of prediction with expert advice. Um, I have left plenty of time uh, for you to ask questions, uh, so please feel free to interrupt me and uh, uh, clarify what might be and ask me for clarifications. Okay, this is joint work with Bob Cohn and Jeff Calder. Okay, so uh, here's the outline of my talk. Um, I would start with an introduction uh, about the field of the field, talk about the setup, uh, move on to the problem that is um, the main topic of the talk, uh, discuss the main result and a simple case um, of how we obtain this problem. And then time permitting, I can talk about the general case. Okay, so what is prediction with expert advice? Um, it's a very old problem coming from the 60s. Uh, we're given a data stream of data and we have a pool of experts which make predictions about that data. So um, there is a player or an, what we'll call an investor throughout the talk who uses the expert advice to make predictions about the data. So think of a, a stock and the BIs uh, represent the movement of the stock with plus one unit or minus one unit. And then uh, the player is trying to uh, synthesize uh, information from the experts who are making predictions about this stock. So the player's performance is measured by what's called regret which is the difference between an expert's performance and a player's performance. Uh, a key feature of uh, our analysis is that we perform a worst case analysis, meaning we don't assume any structure of the data stream. So it's not necessarily coming from a probabilistic distribution, for example, even though theoretically it could, um, but actually we assume that the data stream is controlled by an adversary um, who is trying to prevent the player from doing well. So uh, the player in the market are, and the player in the adversary, which we'll call investor in the market in a second, are uh, a two player zero sum game where there's minimax optimal strategies. So the player is trying to minimize regret and the market is trying to maximize regret, the market or the adversary. Um, so the, there are many applications for this problem. So financial math click prediction, algorithm boosting and so on. Um, and I'll use the terminology that we have an investor, that's the player and we have a market, that's the adversary. So let's look at an example from prediction with expert advice. I'm sorry. Um, so example one, let's try to predict whether it's going to rain or not. So the question is, do you carry an umbrella or not for the day? And uh, there are a lot of possible experts you could listen to in order to uh, make your decision. Um, so those could be weather channel uh, pre predictors. Um, it could be a simple statement as it would rain today if it didn't rain yesterday or if it rained yesterday. Uh, you could have a predictor saying it always rains. So you always carry the umbrella or maybe it never rains so you never carry the umbrella. So as you can see there are a lot of uh, possible experts and you're trying to figure out which experts to listen to. Another example, uh, this time prediction with expert advice. Um, so this is again in, in the um, financial math framework that I'm going to be 
using to present today. So we have a stock which is controlled by a market which goes up or down. And you know that there's N experts and among those experts, there's one who's always right. So the question is, how can you invest optimally um, in the long run? So if instead of always right, each prediction were right with a certain probability, we recover a version of the multi-arm bandit problem, which you may be familiar with. Uh, regardless, we assume for this particular example, we assume that um, there is the expert who's always right. So what can you do? On every turn, you only care about the experts who have been right on every turn, because that's where um, the special expert is. Um, so you look at what those experts predict and you bid the majority, uh, you bid the outcome that the majority of the experts chose. Um, so when you do that, if you make a mistake, there's a lot of experts who've made a mistake too. And in fact, at least half of them will have made a mistake because of the way that you predict. Um, so in this case, you can weed out half of the experts or more of that uh, or more. And um, um, if the uh, experts were right, then you stay with the same experts and you do not incur a penalty. So you bid like this until there's only one expert left. Uh, and this expert is the one who's always been right. So from there on, once you've determined which expert is correct at all, all, term, uh, at all times, you just follow that expert. And because of the halving of uh, experts at every turn when there's a mistake, the number of errors actually turns out to be the a logarithm of the experts base two. Okay, here's yet another example. Uh, this is my favorite example. So um, this is an example of history dependent prediction. Uh, and since that's gonna be the topic of my talk today, I think it's very illustrative. So um, there's a baseball game happening every day. And uh, what you need to know is that there's a special player called the starting pitcher um, who plays every five games. And um, that starting pitcher can influence the game a lot. And the rest of the defense and offense will assume plays daily. So when there's a betting side trying to predict uh, what's the outcome of the game uh, every day, um, they naturally want to incorporate the fact that there's the special defender as a result, um, they have algorithms which use uh, what, uh, have, what was the uh, performance of this special player five, 10 and so on games ago. Um, so those are the time dependent, uh, I'm sorry, history dependent ex expert predictions. And you imagine as a gambler, you're trying to figure out how to use those history dependent algorithms to make a prediction of your own, what would be the outcome of the game? So the question is, um, how can you make uh, pre essentially predictions, which is um, betting money over the long period of time, say 162 game season, which is the case in baseball. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll move on in that case. Okay, so there have been a lot of algorithms trying to solve problems like this. The most popular ones are the weighted majority algorithm and follow the perturbed leader. There have been also uh, solutions for more specific problems. So the weighted majority algorithm and follow the perturbed leader are um, algorithms that are widely used uh, over a lot of different problems. Um, they typically yield uh, square root of n uh, results where n is the number of steps played. Um, so 
those algorithms produce general bounds, which is good, but the question is, can we do better? So for some specific problems like the randomized strategies problem that I've worked on, um, there are algorithms which perform better than the uh, generic ones. Um, and so the randomized strategies problem have been approached uh, from different people, by different people, and they have made uh, progress in them using different methods, for example, random walks. Um, and uh, we have also worked on a PD approach to those problems. Um, and so, um, you know, there we've obtained strategies um, that have been more accurate than the generic ones. So those are problems that are widely used in online machine learning. Um, our work is focused on the optimality in the general setting of uh, N experts, which I'll explain in a second. Okay, so here's the main problem of this talk. We have a repeated two person game. We have an investor or a player who invests optimally in the stock. Um, we have a market who's the adversary, um, who works, uh, tries to um, prevent the uh, investor or the player from uh, doing well. Uh, there's a measure of performance minimizing a function of regret. And uh, there are N experts. The investor doesn't know who's the best performing expert because the best performing expert would be evaluated at the end of the game. So the investor needs to figure out how to uh, leverage the information that he obtains from the um, uh, from the experts in order to figure out what's the next investment. So the idea is that uh, the investor uses expert advice because the experts have developed good models. For example, the invest, um, if you were thinking of um, the weather example, you would want to listen to the uh, weather websites more so than you would want to listen to um, a random forecaster. In more detail, um, let me introduce the math. Um, so this is the history dependent problem. We have a stock that goes up or down and we have an adversarial market who controls the, the stock. And then there's historical states of data, which uh, encode what happened over the past D days. So for example, we have M to be this uh, seven digit um, number. So zeros correspond to the stock having gone down and ones correspond to the stock going up. And the uh, key feature is that uh, when you move, uh, when the next stock comes, uh, stock movement comes up, then you move from uh, the past seven uh, days of data to uh, incorporate the newest day uh, uh, worth of data. So um, what happens is that you forget what happened eight days ago and you concatenate what happened on the newest uh, outcome. So you forget this digit and you append a digit here or here. Um, so there are time dependent experts, as I said, we can think of the experts as algorithms. So for each uh, historical data state, uh, M, we have an algorithm QI of M, which measures um, which shows the prediction of the experts. Um, and each time step, the investor is uh, making an investment of uh, F, um, which represents whether they're buying or selling stocks. And then uh, the measure of performance, as I said before, is regret. So that's the difference between the best performing experts gain and the investors gain. And so, uh, for each turn, the investor accumulates regret QI minus FK um, times the change 
in the stock BK. So if uh, BK is negative one, then we have, um, we compare FK with QI this way. And uh, um, that's just um, what, you, with, what you see when you write down the difference of investments between um, the algorithm QI and the investment of the uh, player, which is FK. Okay, so uh, here's the main question of this talk. Uh, we're given a final time t and a current time tau, which is less than t. And we're also given the previous history, in particular, the previous history of d days of data. And so the question is, um, what's the optimal strategy for you as an investor? so that your optimal strategy guarantees the least amount of regret at the final time. And uh, in this talk, we would work with N history dependent experts. Um, in a part of the talk, I would focus on N equals two experts to illustrate ideas. But for now, we are focused on the N uh, case. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see um, what happens when we play n steps of the game. So um, the instantaneous regret or the regret for one day is uh, the sine bk plus one or minus one times q minus fk. So this is what happens on day k. And uh, this is the instantaneous regret when we sum up over uh, days one through n, we obtain the regret uh, so far, which is the sum of the daily regrets. And so when we're given a final payoff function g, um, the goal of the market is to maximize this function g of rn, and the investor's goal is to minimize this function of rn. Um, so this function essentially tells us how well you're you're performing um, if we were given the vector of regrets are in. Um, so here, um, Rn measures the regret with respect to expert x1, x2, x3, and so on. Um, yeah, so, so x1 here is regret with respect to expert x1 at the end of time in uh, evaluated at the end of time for the function g. Okay, so we have this final function g, which helps us measure um, how much, uh, what's the performance of the expert, I'm sorry, the performance of uh, the investor. And so we uh, make a few assumptions on the payoff function g. Um, so the most uh, stringent restriction is that we want the uh, set of uh, derivatives up to fourth order to be bounded, but we can actually relax this condition when G is considered Lipschitz. Um, but for this talk, in the interest of uh, presenting it more clearly, um, I would focus on the case where G is, has bounded derivatives up to fourth order. Okay, so let's try to figure out how to um, work with the final function g. So uh, if there are no more turns left, then g is the function of the final time regret. And this is, uh, our, uh, this is what measures our performance. Um, when there's one day left, then the market is trying to maximize the regret of the player. So the market chooses B to be plus one or minus one. And the player is trying to minimize their regret. So they're choosing F over here as to, man as to minimize their regret. So there's this interplay between the player and the market that happens over one step. So here you forget about the sum, you just have the regret that that's accumulated plus the, um, 
uh, plus the optimal investment. Um, and then you min-max this expression. So this is the value function, which tells us what's the measure, uh, what's the regret accumulated at the end of time, if both the player and the market were playing optimally against each other. So that's why we have a min-max structure. And we can repeat this process. We can inductively ask, uh, what's the optimal strategy if we were to play two days of data and we'll have a min max of a min max. And uh, by backwards induction or recursion, you can see that actually um, the optimal thing that could be done on day L is the optimal thing that could be done um, over, uh, over the next L through N minus one uh, terms. Okay, so um, this is all good, but why is this helpful? So we can relate this value function, which measures what's your regret at the end of the game to the value function one day later. Um, so, in particular, the optimal thing that can do today, that can happen today, is the optimal investment um, for the day plus the optimal investments over the next uh, day. So we have that Vn is related to Vn plus one uh, via min max. So this is just uh, on unpacking this statement over here about the min-max of the min-max. And so we define epsilon to be n to the power minus a half. And uh, we rescale this value function vn to the function u sub epsilon. And so the question becomes, what can we say about u epsilon as epsilon goes to zero? So basically the question is, what's the optimal strategy of the player, what's the optimal strategy of the market, and how much regret U epsilon is acquired um, at the end of the game. Um, and so, um, as you will imagine, epsilon will go to zero as it's a small number. And the question is, as epsilon goes to zero, can we extract something about the optimal strategies of the player in the market. Um, and just to make a note, we'll use the dynamic programming principle uh, later in the talk. It basically has to do with um, the optimal thing that happens today, is the optimal thing that uh, is the optimal investment today plus the optimal behavior from tomorrow on. Okay, so here's the main result for the talk. Uh, we will focus on the solution U of this uh, PD. Um, the PD is uh, degenerate parabolic um, and uh, it's nonlinear as you can see because the increments eta are uh, actually a function of the partial derivatives. And so uh, we work with this PD and what we'll show is that the solution U of this PD is related to the optimal uh, solution U epsilon. In particular, we have the following theorem. We assume G to be nice and some of the assumptions for D to hold. Um, then we look at U which is the unique viscosity solution of the PD that I just wrote down. And as the small parameter epsilon goes to zero, then we have that U epsilon converges to U. In particular, if we have that, uh, we work with uh, smooth C4 functions, we can actually extract the rate of convergence. So U epsilon minus U um, is bounded by a constant times epsilon, where epsilon is this n to the minus one half. 
And we can show convergence for when G slip shifts as well. Okay, so this is the main result of the talk. Um, this result tells us that um, we can approximate the uh, final time, uh, the value function, I'm sorry, uh, through the, uh, the solution of a PDE. And moreover, we'll show that the um, optimal investment, uh, uh, optimal investment that comes from U uh, is asymptotically optimal for U epsilon, meaning that um, we can find the function of U um, on every step so that when we invest with that function uh, of U, we obtain an asymptotically optimal uh, behavior for U epsilon. Okay, so a little bit of uh, formulas. Uh, we have eta m, which is um, the difference between the investment Q of the uh, player, uh, the investment of the experts, minus an expression that uh, involves the gradient of U. We form a even more complicated expression involving, involving eta and the Hessian, the uh, matrix of uh, second order partial derivatives of U. And so we consider the unique solution of the constant of this Poisson problem on a graph, which I'll talk about in a minute. And so when we look at um, the Laplacian of H equals the uh, right-hand side. Um, we look at the unique solution H of this problem, unique up to a constant, and then this, uh, the solution to this uh, Poisson equation um, comes into the optimal strategies. So the optimal strategy is a function of the derivatives uh, a few and uh, a function of this uh, solution over the graph. Um, and so in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to try to convince you that uh, the graph is important and that um, the solution of this uh, Poisson equation over the graph is actually what we need in order to come up with the optimal strategy. And so F star is the optimal strategy of the uh, investor and the market uh, penalizes this optimal strategy if the player were to invest F and uh, F was not F star, then the market can take advantage of that and uh, choose the sign of F star minus F to make the investor uh, acquire more regret. Okay, so uh, here's what I've told you so far. We have a problem which is a discrete time iterative process. Um, this is the making decisions over, over every uh, time step. And uh, we, we saw this discrete optimization problem which we wrote VN. And we, um, we decided instead of to look at this, a discrete problem to identify a PDE solution related to that problem. And the PDE tells us what's the optimal investment and how much regret would be accumulated at the end of the game. The optimal investment, as you may recall, is uh, here. And uh, U is the value of the regret that would be accumulated at the end of the game. So um, what I've shown so far is that um, we have a discrete formulation <clears throat> and it turns out to be a um, numerical scheme for the appropriate PDE. So the PDE is approximated by um, this um, numerical scheme. Okay, so <clears throat> let's focus on the case of two experts. Um, I'll try to show you where um, where do the strategies come from and where, where the uh, a proof, uh, how a proof would look like. So 
um, we make an assumption that your epsilon is smooth. Uh, we know that that's not the case, but um, this is just a heuristic to help us um, identify the PE. So U is a min max of U at the next time step. This is the dynamic programming principle that they wrote over here. The relationship uh, of Vn related to Vn at the next day, which when we scale um, with epsilon is the dynamic programming principle over here. And so we use this knowledge to uh, perform Taylor expansion because we have a smooth function. And so we obtain that the Taylor expansion looks like this. We have a zeroth order term, epsilon ordered term, epsilon squared order term, and so on. And what we observe is that U on both sides can cancel out. So we're looking at the min max of an expression up to um, of an expression multiplied by epsilon. And so uh, this expression says how much regret is being accumulated um, for, the for each term. And uh, what we can show is that uh, the player could uh, pick an investment F tilde. And this investment would uh, make it so the gradient of U times the change in regret delta X becomes zero. And if the player was not choosing such a, an investment, then gradient of U times the change in X would have a sign. And so the uh, market can choose B to have the corresponding sign so that the uh, this epsilon expression um, uh, is chosen in such a way as to penalize the investment of the, um, of the player. In other words, um, the market can choose B in such a way as to make the investor accumulate regret faster. So that's why up to a leading order term, we choose the investment F tilde. And when we do that, there's no first order term and no second, uh, there's no zero and first order terms. So we focus on the second order term. And so we see that UT turns out to be proportional to delta X transpose times the Hessian times delta X, which when we uh, expand turns out to be this expression. Okay, so this expression is a function of M. Recall that M was the um, state, the historical state that we were looking at, and Q of M was the, um, the vector of predictions of the, um, of the experts. And so when we look at this formula UT, uh, and we decide to look at what happens after a couple of terms of the game, then we see that K times UT is proportional to this sum of, um, of um, Hessian times regrets. And so what we observe is that there would be two second time scales. Uh, one time scale has to do with um, you can looking at UT and seeing how much UT changes. And uh, part of that is this Q of MJ, which is uh, changes rapidly as M changes. So uh, this is a fast time scale. And then UT uh, changes on a slower time scale. So let me try to explain why is this important. Okay, so um, as I said before, there's this graph that's, uh, that's related to this problem. And so uh, let's consider a graph where uh, the vertices are the time states. So we, say, we look at the algorithms of the um, experts, those algorithms 
depend on the past D days worth of history. And so uh, we construct a graph with um, vertices, the digits of D symbols. And so uh, let me focus on the case D equals two. So for when D equals two, we have the following four historical states, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, and zero, one. And so what happens is if we look at state zero, zero, for example, if the stock went up, uh, the historical state becomes zero, one. And if the stock went down, we stay at state zero, zero. Um, and so uh, if you will remember this expression ut is a function of the historical state. So this function uh, that, so we have a function that measures how much regret is accumulated for each vertex. And uh, as the historical states uh, change, meaning when the stock goes up or down, um, there's a walk that's formed on the graph, which measures uh, how much regret is accumulated as you walk around the, around the graph. And so this happens over many, many time steps. Uh, so the question is, uh, what happens in the long run? Um, you have different functions at different vertices. As you move along the graph, you sum up those functions. And so what can we expect um, for this to look like in the long run? And so just to show you, um, the graph was simple for d equals two. This is the graph of d equals three. So we have two to the three, eight states. And uh, this is what the graph looks like. And if you were to choose d to be bigger, uh, then um, then the graph becomes untractable, um, at least computations on the graph become difficult. Okay, so coming back to the optimal investment. So we knew that uh, up to first order term, we choose um, the investment in such a way as to get rid of the order epsilon term. But when we make a correction epsilon f sharp, we obtain that ut plus this function uh, that represented the uh, regret change on the graph minus b times f sharp is the order epsilon squared term. And this order epsilon squared term is actually all of epsilon because all the previous terms cancel. And so uh, the question is, how can the player choose F sharp so that the uh, it's so that the accumulation of regret is the least possible over a long period of time? So um, I told you before that this investment F sharp is actually the difference between those functions H at the next two time steps. So here we had um, h plus minus h minus. And so when we look at this problem in the simple case of d at most four and two experts, um, we see that alternatively we can solve a linear program. And uh, in order to obtain the optimal strategy, we solve this linear program and we obtain values for F sharp. And so if M, is, if M sharp is chosen in such a way so that um, all the cycles on our graph, so all those cycles have equal weight, then um, the, market, uh, the market choice doesn't matter because the player chooses strategies such that going across um, any set of um, uh, vertices walking through the graph, the amount accumulated would be uh, the same average amount. Or rather when the um, regret is accumulated as you move on the graph, um, the regret accumulated 
averages out to um, this average value on the graph. So uh, here's the result for n equals two. We look at the chain, uh, the time derivative of u plus an expression of uh, NABLA, expression of the Hestian u. And so uh, we can unravel this uh, partial differential equation and uh, it has a constant C sharp, which constant is T um, is proportional to the average regret on the graph. Um, so M corresponds to any data state and we sum up over any history, we sum up the difference between the two experts um, performance squared. Uh, recall that this is the case n equals two, so we just have two experts. So this expression is simple. And so the main result is that uh, we have u epsilon minus u and they differ by um, regret proportional to epsilon. Um, how much time do I have? Um, about 10 minutes, I'd say. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, as we said, the optimal strategy had the form um, gradient of u times the investment q plus a corrector of order epsilon. And uh, you can either obtain f sharp from a linear program or you obtain f sharp from solving the Poisson equation that I showed you and setting F sharp to be the difference of the solution of this Poisson equation. Okay, so here's an indication of uh, what we may wanna do if we wanted to uh, prove something about the problem. So we look at the dynamic programming principle Vn and Vn turns into U epsilon by our scaling. Um, let me emphasize how we obtain u epsilon from Vn. So um, what we did is we scaled Vn with epsilon in space and epsilon squared in time. So let me go back to this statement. So the scaled value function u epsilon is proportional to Vn with a scaling of epsilon inverse times x and one over epsilon squared for t. So this scaling over here is very similar to scaling of um, random walk to a Brownian motion. So in the random walk, we scale space with epsilon and uh, time with epsilon squared and we obtain a random walk and we obtain a, a Brownian motion. So similarly to that, we introduce what's called a parabolic scaling, meaning we scale x with uh, epsilon and t with epsilon squared. And uh, when we do that, our dynamic programming principle over here is just written through um, epsilon steps in, in space and uh, epsilon squared space in time, uh, step in time. So this is our one dimensional dynamic programming principle, which if you recall, we uh, expanded using Taylor extension and uh, we had all those terms uh, cancel out and the order epsilon squared term is the one that we found um, that's related to the PDE. Okay, so we can do something similar instead of for one time step, we can write the k-step dynamic programming principle, which says, I'm going to relate the regret today to the regret in a couple of days, having taken into account the min-max uh, structure of the problem. So, oops. Okay, so u epsilon is min max of a min max of u epsilon at the nearby uh, time step. Uh, 
k, t plus k epsilon squared because k steps have occurred. And then uh, delta x um, um, is the sum of the instant of the changes that happened for each time step. And then um, because we started to the historical state m and uh, we look at what happened over k uh, time steps, we concatenate m with b1 to take into account the fact that um, the next uh, time step involved b1 and so on we obtain m bar b1 bar b2 and so on which is just what happened with the historical state after bk steps. And so again, we make an assumption that u epsilon is proportional to u for a smooth u. And then we obtain the following expression min max, min max. We perform Taylor expansion over here. And instead of Taylor expansion for one step, we have it for k steps. So we have k times epsilon squared ut, again, plus a first order term, plus a second order term. And so related to this is uh, the function h, which is uh, zeta um, plus an average over zetas, where zeta is um, a quantity proportional to the second order Hessian. Um, and it's precisely the one that I defined it earlier in the talk. It was um, was this expression that I told you about. Um, we look at the investment uh, difference eight, uh, eta m, and then we multiply it by the Hessian squared to obtain zeta. Um, and so this expression eta of m, we can show solves the Poisson equation that we looked at. And so this h is uh, the quantity that we needed in order to write down the optimal strategy for the player. So here's how we can think of H. So um, the regret on, suppose we're at state 101, the regret associated to state 101 is zeta 101. And then we can make a choice um, as the market makes a choice whether the state goes to 010 or 011. So as before, we forget about the first order digit one, because that's the um, past history. And then we append the newest history zero or one. So from one zero one, we move to zero one zero. And there we accumulate regret uh, zeta zero one zero. Alternatively, the market could have sent us to zero one one, which corresponds to zeta zero one one. But if we are at um, an optimal strategy, then it doesn't matter which direction the market sends us to, the amount of, of regret accumulated um, is actually the same no matter which direction you're sent through. So the regret over the next time step we can write as the average of the regrets at the potential next state. And so um, if you look at three days worth of history, you can look at the um, average associated with the um, next data states where you could have gone from 0, 1, 0 and 0, 0, 1. And so you can repeat this process and you obtain the H that I just told you about. And so it happens that H solves this Poisson equation um, on the graph and we can show that uh, when uh, this is the optimal, uh, when we choose a, uh, H in such a way, um, then it turns out that the optimal strategies are, um, as I said, uh, written through H. 
And uh, here's a reminder um, of the main theorem that I showed you. Um, we show that U epsilon converges to U uniformly. And moreover, um, if we um, have sufficient smoothness of uh, U's derivatives, we can now also show that U epsilon minus U um, is proportional to epsilon. Um, I should have said if we have sufficient smoothness of the final time function G, then we have um, a smoothness of, uh, then we have convergence of order epsilon, where if you recall, epsilon is one over square root of n. Okay, so here are the main takeaways from my talk. We just solved the problem from online machine learning using viscosity solutions and optimal control theory. Um, the problem involved discrete time process with decision making at every time. The goal was to understand the optimal decision over a very long period of time. And because we wanted to solve it over a very long period of time, we used scaling limits. And then, as I pointed out, the discrete formulation of the problem was a numerical scheme for the PDE that we wrote down. Okay, with that.